you know that verse that we just read? It says, the Lord is jealous for Zion. When we open these meetings at the beginning of this week, in the very first session, I shared something with you from Daniel chapter 9, verse 16 through 19. And I encourage you, you know, when you get time on your own this coming week, look that, that three-verse section up in Daniel 9. Daniel says, thy people and thy city and thy mountain, he equates them as being one and the same thing. And we talked about Mount Zion. If you ask any of the children here to draw a mountain, that's what they draw. And if you look at the New Jerusalem, and I may be wrong, I'm, and I'm more than willing to be wrong, but I just can't see God coming down out of heaven in a cube. I just don't visualize or see our God as a cube. New Jerusalem, it says, lie a four square. That means each of its four sides are equal in length. And it says that the height is the same as one of the sides. So either it's a cube, and I'm okay with that, obviously, <laughs> or it's a pyramid. And the neat thing is, is in a cube, you don't have a capstone. A pyramid has to have a capstone. And Christ says, I am the cornerstone and the headstone. He laid the cornerstone 2,000 years ago. And he said, upon this church, or upon this rock, I will build my church. It says here, I am returned. It doesn't say I will return. It says I am returned unto Zion. And I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. We're Jerusalem. This was a promise in the Old Testament that God said, I'm going to come back and dwell inside of my people. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts shall be called the holy mountain. That's a promise that God will make you and I holy. Tonight we're going to look at the cleansing of the temple and restoring the glory of God. This week we have looked at the kingdom of God being set up. We have looked at how Satan has worked to defile the temple of God with different abominations. And this is my favorite part. This is the part that I would like to focus on the most. How does God cleanse his temple and restore his glory? The days in which we live are eventful and full of peril. The signs of the coming of the end are thickening around us. And pay attention to this. And events are to come to pass that will be of a more terrible character than any the world has yet witnessed. And I want to I give you a note of assurance here. We are not to live in fear because God says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. The Apostle John was not afraid. The Apostle Peter and Paul were not afraid because they knew in whom they believed. So when we're giving this warning about the, the events are going to come to pass of a more terrible character than any that the world has yet witnessed, that's the world that's afraid. Because Daniel chapter 12 says, at that time, my people are going to shine like the brightness of the firmament. And that's not just a, a poetic phrase that Daniel chose. God inspired those words. Moses shined with the glory of God. Stephen, when he was about to be stoned, was shining with the glory of God. Adam and Eve, when they were in Eden, were shining with the glory of God because God was in them. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. We are to realize that the judgments of God are about to fall upon the earth. Now listen to this. Do not skip over this. Solemn events before us are, what's that say? Yet to transpire. What does it say? Yet. To Yet to transpire. Now read the next sentence. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded, vile after vile, 
poured out one after another upon the inhabitants of the world. I'm willing to be wrong. I mean, if I'm wrong, praise God, I'm not worried about it. Let God be true and every man a liar. But when I look in the Old Testament, God had Feast of Trumpets before the close of probation, which was Day of Atonement. The trumpets sounded throughout the entire land of Israel for one reason. One reason. It was to tell the people to get ready, to get their hearts right. When I go to Revelation chapter 11, 8, 9, 10, 11, the trumpets are beginning to sound. Chapter 14, God's people are being sealed. Chapter 15, the judgments are poured out without mercy. The seven last plagues. She says, trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded, vial after vial poured out, one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. We should most earnestly present before the people the warning that our Lord has commissioned us to give. Now listen. Remember the three angels' message. Listen. Let everyone who claims to believe that the Lord is soon coming search the scriptures as never before. I used to search the scriptures to try to understand the prophecies. Now I'm searching the scriptures because I want God to come back into me. I want to be just like Jesus. I want to be like the apostles were in the days of Acts. I'm not worried about all the prophecies. Yes, they're going to come. I'm not saying it's not important, but what's more important is that I am clean, that my family is clean, that our faith is, is built on something that cannot be shaken in the storm. For Satan is determined to try every device possible to keep you and I in darkness and blind the mind to the perils of the time in which we are living. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revealing of the righteousness of Christ as the sin-pardoning Redeemer. You want to know what the third angel's message is? I wish we could go into that. If I had one more night, there's some beautiful things there at the end of Revelation 14. It says, this is the beginning of the light of that angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. The beginning of that light is Christ being revealed as the sin-pardoning Redeemer. That's the warning that we've got to give the world. It's funny, and I'm just going to make a note of this. This was in First Selected Messages, page 363. I don't remember the year that this was penned, but look at the next one. How will any of our brethren know when this light shall come to the people of God? As yet, we certainly have not seen the light that answers to this description. That was two years after 1888. 1888 was wow. I mean, that was unbelievable what happened. If you ever get a chance, go back and read the messages. Read the messages. Don't read books about the messages. Read the messages that were preached in 1888. It will change your life like nothing, anything you've ever seen. But she says that, that wasn't even close to what God's about to do. Next statement is two years later. If we would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ. Know him like a, a husband knows his wife. That means you have to become one flesh and appropriate the gift of his righteousness. To appropriate something means you count it as your own. I have to say, that's mine. If somebody came to my wife, if I was to, to die in a car wreck or a plane crash or something, my wife wouldn't have to ask to sign my checks or to drive my car. She's my wife. All that is mine is hers but she has to believe it. Do you understand that? The Bible says that we are joint heirs with Christ. Do we believe it? And what, what did Christ, what is he waiting to inherit? Us. The Bible says we are his inheritance. God gave him everything. 
It says we must appropriate the gift of his righteousness which he imputes to the repentant sinner. If you get a chance, look that word up, imputes, and look it up in the Bible. A couple years later, 1898, the storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? Are our feet planted on the rock of ages? And then the next sentence she says, are we one with Christ as he is one with his Father? Guys, that's strong. Look at John chapter 14, verse 10 and 11. They asked Jesus, they said, show us the Father. And he said, have I been so long time with you and you have not known me? And then he explained it in verse 10 and 11. He said, the words that I'm speaking unto you, it's not me speaking them. It's the Father that's in me. That's how Christ is one with his Father. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. When Christ says, I want you to be one, or Ellen White was told to tell us that we should be one with Christ as he is one with the Father, that was the whole purpose. Do you remember what we read in Desire of Ages, page 161? From the beginning of creation, it was God's purpose that every created being should be a temple for him to dwell in. And then she says, by sin, God was no longer a dweller in humanity. The whole purpose was for God to be able to come back inside of man. 1908, 10 years later, the thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. Don't, don't let your Adventist history obscure what that word means. And I know people, they, they get upset with me when I say that. But don't let our traditions blind you to what God's Word says. We tell Sunday keepers, I know you've always done that. I know that your family's always done You have been living in this tradition for 150 years, but you've got to stand on the Word of God. I'm telling you and I, we have to do the same thing. We cannot ask a Sunday keeper to throw out their traditions, and yet we hold on to ours and will not look up the Word in God's Word. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any worthiness or merit on our part, but, what's that say? As a free gift from God is a precious thought. The enemy of God in man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. You want to know what happened to Jones and Wagner? That's what happened. Satan said, I cannot have this. The world is being turned upside down again. And he attacked those two men. He attacked Ellen White. And he attacks everyone that will lift up Christ and him crucified. Satan is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people receive this truth, his power will be broken in your life and mine. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. And I'm going to be careful. What I'm sharing with you has taken a number of years for the Lord to help me to be able to see. So I'm not expecting you to swallow everything I say and just go home and go, what well, has to be so. But I'm encouraging you to go home and dig for yourself. Dig, because it matters. Many of us have the idea in our mind that, well, justification is what Jesus did for me on the cross, but sanctification takes the rest of my life. And I can find quotes from Ellen White that indicate that. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime, right? Did it take Jesus a lifetime to sanctify the thief on the cross? And people say, well, oh, that's different. He didn't have a lifetime. So you're saying Jesus did something for the thief on the cross he's not willing to do for me? And this is questions that went through my mind. If you sanctified that thief in one moment, then how come it has to take me a lifetime? And the Lord, I know he smiled and he said, Eric, he said, I've got I to gotta lead you to my word. In Isaiah chapter 45... 
verse 11 through 19. Do you know what the Lord God says? Jehovah, Yahweh. He says, I am the Lord. I speak righteousness. I declare and make things right. It's dark. I speak light. She's a prostitute. I speak purity. He's got leprosy. I speak wholeness. He speaks. Isaiah 60, 63 verse 1 says, I the Lord speak righteousness. I declare and make things right. This is the third angel's message in Verity. And I said, God, then how come your servant said it's a, it's a work of a lifetime? And God said, Eric, I'm asking you to walk by faith every moment for the rest of your life. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime, but it's not your work, it's his work. Amen. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath before ordained that he will walk in us. It's not that it takes God a lifetime to fix somebody. He does it in a moment, but you have to believe that and walk in faith every moment for the rest of your life. This is what the word justification and justified. This is the definition in Hebrew and Greek. This is a consolidation of every word. And you can look this up in Strong's Concordance. Justification and justified. To declare or to render innocent. Innocent does not mean pardoned. When my wife and I went through that divorce, that was my fault. I divorced her. I was committing adultery. I was the one that left my family. And somebody could come to my wife or me and they could say, well, Eric, are you guilty? And I could say, I'm forgiven, but yes, I'm still guilty. But if I believe God's word, God's word says that God laid on Christ the iniquities of us all. Behold the Lamb of God, which... Wait a minute. If he took them away, then are they still on me? We have been led to believe by the great deceiver that Christ only took away the penalty of our sins. But that is not what the Bible says. He took the sins away. And if he took them, they're not yours anymore. And then he does a miracle. He takes our life, if we will give it to him, and he gives us his life where there was not one sin ever. Justified, declared, rendered, innocent, just, pure, clean, holy, righteous, and perfect. When I was in high school, I wanted to be an architect because my dad was an architect. And I remember in our architecture class, my professor came in, and he was hardcore. I really liked him, but he was hardcore. And he would give us um, a pamphlet like this, and it would have the directions for a drawing written. Do you remember those, those math tests that you'd have to take, and it was a written problem? I hated those things. Because, I mean, you're like, does that mean this? Or did they mean, is that word in the right place? He would give us a written description of what to draw. And we would have to decipher it and draw it. At the end of six weeks, he would ask everybody, are you all ready for the test? And we would say, yes, sir. Are your drawings completed? Yes, sir. And we all had the same drawing. And he would pull out one of those old transparencies. Do you know what I'm talking about? And it had the exact perfect pattern of what we were told to draw. And he would come and he would lay his transparency down on top of our architecture paper, our drafting paper. And if the lines matched perfectly, the paper was called justified. It matches the pattern perfectly. Ellen White says that when Moses was shown the pattern to build the tabernacle, she says the pattern was Christ. God took him up into Mount Sinai and he didn't show him a blueprint. He
He showed him Jesus, and he said, I want you to make a tabernacle that represents this. She said, Christ is the pattern that we are to make our lives after. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for you and I that which it is not in our power to do for ourselves. When men see their own nothingness, then we are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Do you understand why the Pharisees hated Jesus? Do you understand why men hated Jones and Wagner when they were presenting this message in 1888? Nobody wants to hear that you're worthless. But do you know what? I have never found more peace than in that. Christ, I'm helpless and I'm worthless without you then we are prepared to be clothed with his righteousness. Now listen to this one. We must learn in the school of Christ nothing but his righteousness can entitle us to one of the blessings of the covenant of grace. I've always had problems with phrases like that because in my mind I'm trying to dissect what all that means. The covenant of grace. It's easy just to read over that and miss the word. Covenant. We have long desired and tried to obtain these blessings, but we have not received them because we have cherished the idea that we could do something to make ourselves worthy of them. I had one man tell me something one time, and I like this man. I'm friends with him. But he told me something. He said, Eric... He said, I really believe God wants to heal you of the diabetes completely. And I said, okay, I'm listening. He said, what God wants you to do before he will heal you is keep every one of his health laws. And I, I got off the phone and I was like, okay, God, I'm, I'm, I'm willing. And I tried for about a week. And then you know what happened? A question came to my mind. At what point do I know that I've kept all of them? I mean, like, we're going to be learning from here into eternity. So when do I know that I've got them all right? What if I was to go to a man and I was to say, well, Jesus, will, he will save you once you obey all the truth in his word. And he says, okay, I'm keeping the Sabbath. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. My wife stresses long enough. And I go, oh, yeah, by the way, his name is not Jesus. It's Yeshua. You've been pronouncing it wrong. Or, oh, yeah, by the way, this is a truth that you didn't know yet. What does Jesus do with that? What does God do with that? And God helped me to realize something. I am not to obey him in order to gain him healing me. That was done at the cross. I obey him because I'm in love with him. He heals me because he's merciful. Ten men came to Jesus one day that had leprosy. Full-blown AIDS, if you want to have a parable. Do you understand? I mean, they're rotting. They smell bad. Ten of them. How many did Jesus heal? They all ran, and only one came back, and God took the healing away from the other nine a week later. You don't think he did that? They weren't even thankful. He healed them because he loved them, and he was having mercy. If we have the picture of a God that goes, they didn't come back, boom, I'm taking it back from them. Do you know what that does to a person or to a child to think of God like that? By his mercy, he saved us. 1 Timothy 1, 9 and Titus chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. By his mercy. It says... Nothing but his righteousness can entitle us to one of the blessings of the covenant of grace. Most of our Adventist brothers and sisters think that a covenant is a contract. And the reason we think that is because of what happened at Mount Sinai. God gave his covenant, and the people said, everything that God said, we will do. And you know what it says? God had to come in and say, well, if you obey, here's the blessings. If you disobey, here's the curses. 
I've got two articles, one from E.J. Wagner and I've got another article from Ellen White that are almost identical about the two covenants. Do you know what Wagner said? He said, God never asked them to make that promise. Ellen White says every command is a promise. God said, you won't steal. You won't murder. And they said, everything you've said, I will do. And God said, I never told you to do that. I didn't ask you to make a promise to me. I was promising you if you'll just open your heart and let me in to do it. We must learn in the school of Christ. A covenant, and I'm going to show you this, Micah chapter 7, 18 through 20, it talks about the covenant that God made with Abraham. When you go to Luke chapter 1, verse 67 through 75, it says that that covenant was the oath and promise of God. A covenant is not a contract. I come to the marriage altar with my wife and we're there and the pastor says, Eric, will you do this? And I say, yes, sir. And he asks my wife, will you do this? Yes, sir. And I look at my wife and I say, oh yeah, by the way, I've got a prenuptial agreement. If you don't make the bed every morning, if you don't have my shoes shined every Friday night, and if you don't have dinner ready exactly by 5 o'clock, it's null and void. What would my wife do at the marriage altar? I mean, she would be in tears. And you know, I read something from Ellen White that really encouraged me. She said, all of our promises are like ropes of sand. How many times have you promised God something and then found out a week later, a month later, you weren't able to do it? Or you failed? I would never write a contract with a man that I knew couldn't keep his promises. God did not make a contract with mortal men. He gave a promise, and Abraham believed that promise, and God gave it to him for righteousness. My brethren, are you expecting that your merit or worthiness will recommend you to the favor of God, thinking that you must be free from sin before you trust his power to save you from sin? If this is the struggle going on in your mind, I fear you will gain no strength and will finally become discouraged. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a disclaimer right now. I know what this sounds like. I am probably more on fire for the law than most of you would care to know about. But in 1888, the majority of our church said Jones and Wagner are throwing the law out. And they weren't but they were just showing that you can't keep it by yourself. And you can't ask God to give you something while he's up there and you're down here. God gave us one gift, Jesus. And when that gift is in you, every other gift is there. In the wilderness, when the Lord permitted poisonous serpents to sting the rebellious Israelites, Moses was directed to lift up a brazen serpent and bid all the wounded to look to it and live. What did they have to do to live? Wow. You ought to type that phrase in, look and live, in Ellen White's CD-ROM, or on an Ellen White estate. Look and live. It will bring tears to your eyes, which you will find. But many saw no help in this heaven-appointed remedy. The dead and dying were all around them, and they knew without divine help their fate was certain. When you read this full article, she actually says that many of them said, I'm too, I'm too far gone. Looking at that serpent will not heal me. Others, she said, actually told people around them, I have a remedy of my own. I've got this herb, and I've got this drug, and I've got this method, and, you know, do you understand? It says that. I don't need to look. I've got another way. I've got these special ointments or potions or herbs or whatever. And they died. But rather than believe and look, they would lament their wounds, their pains, and their sure death until their strength was gone and their eyes were glazed. What's that say? When they might have had. What's it say? That's God. The Bible says that. 
they were healed instantly, immediately, when they looked. The looking was the act of faith. God has light for his people, and all who will accept this light will see the sinfulness of remaining in a lukewarm condition. They will heed the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans when he says, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and sup with you and you with me. What do you think he feeds you? The same thing that he ate. The same thing that Jesus ate. Satan was seeking to shut out from men a knowledge of God, knowing God. Satan doesn't care if people... He loved the Pharisees. They knew all about God, but they did not know him intimately. They were not one with him. Satan sought to turn their attention from the temple of God and to establish his own kingdom. The temple of God was a symbol of what God wanted us to be. Through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned men away from God, but he won his greatest triumph in perverting the faith of Israel. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion, and it had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Guys, that's what was wrong with our church in 1888. The principle that man can do it on his own had become the principle in our church. Satan had implanted this principle, and wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. None. You may be able to stop your hand or your eyes from doing that wrong thing, but you cannot change your own heart. Jesus said, Well did Isaiah prophesy of us, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. They have a form or a shape of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. You give us the rules, and we can do it. That's what Satan said in Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 1 and 2. Satan told God, you made us holy. We can no more err than you can. I don't need you whispering. That's not, his, that's not in Patriarchs and Prophets. The other part is. He said, we can no more err than you can. What he was saying is, is, I don't need you to be inside of me to keep me in the right. I can do it on my own. Every created being was supposed to be a temple for God. Satan didn't want that. He said, I don't want to hear your whispering in my ear. I can do this on my own. I'm a big boy, Daddy. Let go of my hand. When Jesus came here, he said, Father, hold my hand. I can do nothing without you. 1 Timothy 3.16, we are told, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You want to be godly? There's only one way. God has to get back inside of his temple of our hearts. This is what Jesus said. This is the word or this is the food that he ate. He said, as the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, Jesus is the word of God, even he shall live by me. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Ellen White says it's through the word of God that Christ dwells inside of us. I can't wrap my head around that, but I can surely believe it and trust him. The fountain of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure. Do you know why it's so hard for us? And it's hard for me. Guys, I have failed probably worse than anybody here. When I see somebody doing wrong, especially my family, I want to fix it. But I, 
If I tried to do open heart surgery on my wife when I got home tomorrow night, do you know what she would do to me? <laughs> she would run or slap me. If my wife tried to do open heart surgery on me, I would, I mean, I would shove her away from me. What are you doing? You can't fix somebody's insides. That's why the Jews had added all these extra rules and laws that God had never spoken because they were trying to fix the externals rather than letting Christ in. Do you know the Bible says in Deuteronomy, I think, chapter 4, and it also repeats it in Jeremiah 29. I believe it's Jeremiah 29. He says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your hearts. Have you ever read that? And I thought about that one day. You know, I remember Moses, he was a, a grown man when he was told he had to be circumcised. You know, when the, the tribes of Israel, when somebody else would come in, you could be 50 years old, they had to be circumcised. And I thought, okay, I'm 52, if I was just now coming to the Lord, and he says, Eric, you gotta be circumcised. And back then they didn't have, you know, you're gonna go to the hospital and, and they're gonna give you some anesthetic, and who knows, they had a sharp stone. Maybe they had a blade. And a man, if he was alone, had to do it to himself. Can you imagine that? And they would be sick for days afterward. God told me, he said, Eric, circumcise your heart. And I thought about it, and I was like, okay, you've got to break the sternum open. So I've got a, a mallet, and I've got a chisel, and you've got to hammer and crack the sternum without injuring the heart that's underneath. So let's say that I'm really, really blessed and I get that. I get it cracked. Then I've got to take my hands and pull open the rib cage. Okay, so the rib cage is open now. I can look down and sort of see my heart, but my hands are tied up because I, I don't have anything now to use a knife to circumcise it. So what if I'm really good and I've got these little strings and I hook something onto my rib cage to keep it open? Okay, so now I've got the scalpel and I'm trying to look inside to cut and circumcise my heart. I would die on the ground trying. Do you understand? God asked us to circumcise our hearts because he was trying to, to show us you can't do it. You have to run to Christ, who is the great physician. He's the only one that can. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. Those are Ellen White's words, inspired by God. Then she says, there is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or an improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. I have spent over 40 years before the Lord helped me to see this, before he opened up my blind and stubborn eyes to see this. I thought God was just going to fix my old life and I could help him. There's no fixing it. It's dead. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. You know what that life is? Jesus. This is from W.W. W. Prescott. Listen to this. He spoke this message in 1895 at the Australian camp meeting. Ellen White gives some unbelievable testimonies because she was there and heard every message that he shared. She said, I have never seen the Spirit of God upon a man like this since 1888 in Minneapolis. To believe on Christ is to receive Christ. He's the Word of God, the promise of God. Not to assent to a creed, but to accept a life. Not to strive for the maintenance of certain outward forms, but to become partakers of the divine nature. Creeds and forms cannot save people from their sins. Terrible is the catalog of sins of those having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. We know in the scripture it's Christ in us. 
It says, to whom God would make known this mystery, even the mystery that has been hid from ages and generations. This was a mystery. Prescott goes on and says, a new life must be imparted before man can live unto God. Except a man be born or begotten from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. This experience depends upon the faith which each one exercises for himself. Do you know the Bible says, if any man or woman be in Christ Jesus, you are... And the word creature is creation. How did God create? And it was. So how does God create man anew? He speaks it, and it is. If any man or woman be in Christ Jesus. So in my mind, I was like, okay, okay, I've got it now. I see it now. How do I get in Jesus? God's Word says God chose you in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world so that you could be holy and without blame before Him in love. God put us in Christ. And Christ says, abide there. Stay where God has planted you. Prescott goes on and says, To all who sincerely pray the prayer, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The reply comes, Believe ye that I am able to do this? According to your faith, be it unto you. Wait a minute. God said he put a new heart within us and he would renew a right spirit within us. I have to appropriate that promise and say, God, I don't feel like it today. It seems like it's clouds and, and maybe I'm depressed, but I stand on your word and you cannot lie. If Satan can control our minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. Ellen White says the way that Christ overcame every temptation is the way we overcome. She said he believed the word of God. That's how he overcame. The simple faith that takes God at his word should be encouraged. God's people must have that faith which will lay hold on divine power. For by grace we are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, even the faith is the gift of God. Jesus says unto each of us, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. That's scary. Nicodemus was a righteous man by the letter of the law, and he was lost. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but within you are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. That was Nicodemus. That was the Apostle Paul. That was me. That was you. Jesus said, For ye make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within you are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, Cleanse first that which is within the vessel, that the outside of them may be clean also. I've tried cleaning the insides. You know, the Bible says, wash your heart. How are you going to wash your heart? There's only one way the heart can be washed. Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Christ cleanses his bride by the washing of the water of the word. When we read his word out loud and when we lay our, our faith, hold on that promise and say, that was written to me, that is spoken to me, it washes us. The word does the work. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart for wi from wickedness that thou mayest be saved. For how long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, 
adultery, fornications, thefts, deceit, false witness, lies, and blasphemies. Job 14.4 says, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Not one. Jeremiah 13 tells us, Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or can the leopard change his spots? Then may you also do good that are accustomed to do evil. God is trying to show us how helpless we are without him but how full of power and invincible we can be in him and him in us. None but God can subdue the pride of man's heart. When you think about pride, that means I can do it. I can do it on my own. That's what she's talking about. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot regenerate ourselves. In the heavenly courts there will be no song sung to me that loved myself and washed myself, redeemed myself. Unto me be glory and honor, blessing and praise. But this is the key note of the song that is sung by many here in this world. They do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart, and they do not mean to know this if they can avoid it. The whole gospel is comprised in learning of Christ. His meekness and lowliness. I thought, God, I've humbled myself before you. I don't understand what that means, Christ's meekness and lowliness. Listen to what he says. Come unto me, all you that are laboring and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Learning of him is learning his meekness and lowliness. And this is what it means. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know... What's that say? Who's that the name of? God and his Son. Then shall you know that I am and that I do nothing of myself. Ellen White says that's how Christ overcame was because God was in him. That's how we overcome is if God and Christ are in us. Jesus went on in John 10, 30 and said, I and my Father are one. He did nothing of himself. John 14, verse 10 and 11, he said the exact same thing. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust. What is regeneration? It is revealing to man what is his own real nature, that in himself he is worthless. Without Christ, we are worthless. We can do nothing without him. This is Desire of Ages, page 172, but it's also found in Romans chapter 8. Listen to this. That which is born... Actually, no, this is John 3, 37. I'm sorry. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. By nature, our heart is evil, and who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. That's Ellen White's words. God's words through the pen of Ellen White. Thus ye speak, O house of Israel, saying, If our sins be upon us, and we pine away, if we are consumed in our sins, how shall we then live? Listen to what God's answer is. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, for the just shall live by faith. How many sins were laid on Jesus? All iniquities, all sins of every human being that has ever lived were put on Christ. Ellen White says that, all. He felt the guilt of every sin of every human being that has ever lived. Jesus felt that guilt when he was closing his eyes on Calvary to die. Do you understand that? All right, when you die, what do we know about the state of the dead? The dead, and they know not anything. Jesus feels your guilt and my guilt, and he dies feeling our guilt. And then the third day, 
Gabriel comes down from heaven and says, Thou Son of God, your Father calls thee. When Jesus arose, what happened to all that guilt? Have you ever thought about that? Three days earlier, he felt like he had committed every sin that you and I have ever committed. Intellectually, he knew he had not, but his heart told him, You are guilty. He numbered himself with transgressors. And he wakes up the third day and he never looks back. Do you know why? Because God had made an oath to him that if you bear their sins, I wash them all away. When Jesus was called forth from the grave, he never one time ever looked back. Those sins were gone. That's what the apostles tell us in the scriptures we have to do. Reckon yourself also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Being therefore justified by faith, we now have peace with God. The law requires us to present to God a holy character. It demands of men today just what it demanded of Adam and Eden. Perfect obedience. Perfect means there's not one failure. Not one. If you and I live perfect from this day forward, we're still worthy of death. The law still says he has to die. He sinned one time. Perfect harmony with all its precepts in all relations of life under all circumstances and conditions. No unholy thought can be tolerated. No unlovely action can be justified. Now listen to this. As the law requires that which no man of himself can render, the human family are found guilty before the great moral standard. And it is not in the province of the law to pardon the transgressor of law. Wow. There is but one way of escape for the sinner. There is but one agency whereby we may be cleansed from sin. You must accept by faith the propitiation, the atonement that has been made by the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Do you understand that? All our righteousness is filthy rags. On our best day, we are filthy and undone. It is only His life in us that is clean. Under the new covenant, the conditions by which eternal life may be gained are the same as under the old. The conditions are and ever have been based on perfect obedience. Under the old covenant, there were many offenses of a daring, presumptuous character for which there was no atonement even specified by the law. In the new and better covenant, Christ has filled full the law for the transgressors of law if you receive him by faith as a personal savior. Christ is not the minister of sin that does not give us a license to sin, but the apostle Paul says, how can we that are dead to sin continue to live therein? If you died with Christ, sin is gone. His life is now yours. In Hebrew, they read from right to left. So if we take the definition that is given of a covenant in Luke chapter 1, verse 67 to 75, that's an oath and a promise. In the Bible, it talks about the new covenant, it talks about the holy covenant, and it also talks about the everlasting covenant. So if we, if we do, if we put the words in there as they're supposed to be read, this is the oath and promise of God to make us holy. This is the oath and promise of God to make us new. That is the oath and the promise of God to give us everlasting life. God's Word cannot fail. The only thing that will stop God's Word in your life and mine is our lack of believing. It says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 through 19, it says the children of Israel, they did not enter into rest because of unbelief. For it is written, as many as received him, Jesus, the promise and word of God, 
To them gave he power to become the sons of God. Mercy and forgiveness are the reward of all who come to Christ trusting. That means faith. Believing in his worthiness to take away their sins. We are cleansed from sin by the blood of Christ Jesus, our Savior. In order to be candidates for heaven, we must meet the requirement of the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. None of us have been able to do that for even one day on our own. None of us. Have you loved God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, every second, every moment of every day, even last week? None of us have made it. It's only by Christ. His worthiness, His righteousness, His life is our only plea. And you know what's good about that? If Christ is your life, you can't fail. But that takes a moment-by-moment -moment surrender and exercise of faith. She says we can do this only as we grasp by faith the righteousness of Christ. In the prophecy of Daniel, it was recorded of Christ that he shall make reconciliation for iniquity, and he shall bring in everlasting righteousness. Every soul may say, by his perfect obedience, he has satisfied the claims of the law. And my only hope is found in looking to him as my substitute and my surety. Surety means the guarantee. If I sign, if I co-sign a loan for my son or my daughter to get a car, I am their surety. I'm the guarantee that that loan will be paid off. Christ is our guarantee of a perfect life who obeyed the law perfectly for me. That's fine if Jesus is up there and I'm down here, I'm still dead. But if Jesus inside, is inside of you, then his victory and his obedience become ours. By faith in his worthiness, I am free from the condemnation of the law. He clothes me with his righteousness, which answers all the demands of the law. I am complete in him who brings in everlasting righteousness. Jesus presents you and I to God in the spotless garment of which no thread was woven by any human agent. All is of Christ, and all the glory, honor, and majesty are to be given to the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. We're going to close now. I've got a couple of more slides left, but... You know what? It's the end of the week, and I can't, I can't leave without sharing these to you, with you, okay? In the beginning, it was Satan's purpose to separate man from God. Remember, God was in man. Satan said, this will never work. And this purpose he has carried out in every age. As a result of Adam's disobedience, every human being is a transgressor of the law, sold under sin. I told somebody a couple of years ago when we had slavery in America, and guys, I am the most unprejudiced person in the world, so nobody get offended at me, okay? Israelites were slaves. We had black people that were slaves here. We had Chinese that were slaves. Slavery is bad across the board. I'm using this as an example. When we had slavery here in America, there was a plantation. And they had probably 100, 150 slaves on that plantation. And they were hard workers. The master that owned the plantation was unbearable. He would not tolerate any slack. Meanwhile, while all this is happening down south, we had a president that took the presidency, Abraham Lincoln. And he signed a document. Do you remember the name of the document? The Emancipation Proclamation. You ought to look up that word emancipation in Ellen White's writing. She said Christ signed the emancipation papers of the entire human race. Hallelujah. Abraham Lincoln is there in Washington or wherever he was when he signed it, and he signs that Emancipation Proclamation. A year goes by. Two years go by. 
150 slaves are still down there at that place in Alabama or Georgia or Tennessee or wherever working for that man on that, on that plantation in chains. They can't read. They're not allowed to go into town. And one day, a man comes riding by on a horse. And this man is a, a preacher. He's an evangelist. He loves Jesus. He's you and I. And he rides by this plantation and he looks at these men and women out there in the sun sweating and they've got chains on their hands and bands on their neck. And he's like, did I just see that? And he pulls his horse back around and he sees this tall black man out there working. The guy's six foot four, six foot five, 240 pounds, all muscle. And he says, sir, what are you doing? And the man says, I'm working for the man. Why do you have chains on your, on your shackles, on your ankles? Why do you have chains and bands on your wrist and your neck? He says, sir, I don't mean any disrespect, but are, are you blind? I'm a slave. And that man says, have you not heard what our president did? He signed the paper. And the black man looks at him and says, I can't read. We're not allowed to go into town. And the man says, wait a minute. And he reaches in the sack on the side of his horse and he pulls out a document. He says, let me read to you what has been done for you. And he reads to him the good news of what our king has done. And that man, that big, tall, strong black man, he begins to take hold of it by faith. And you know what the other slaves say? Oh, leave that dumb white man alone. He doesn't know. You better get back to work. The master will be here in a few minutes. He's going to beat you good. And that tall black man says, this is the truth. This is the truth. And the white man looks at him and reaches over and he takes his hand. He says, my brother, you are free. For whom the son makes free is free indeed. And that black man shakes the chains off his hands. And he gets on that horse with that white man and the two of them ride together. On that plantation, there was another man and a woman. And they wanted to get married. And they had to sneak to get married behind the master's back. And they did it one night in the quiet. Nine months later, she has a baby. Is that baby born free or is it born a slave? It's not a trick question. If you are a slave, you are the property of the man that owns you. Even in Hebrew times, the Hebrews were the same way. And whatever you produce is owned by the man that owns you. As a result of Adam's disobedience, every human being was sold under sin. We sin because we were born slaves, and Christ came to set the captives free. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And, G and Nicodemus said exactly what I said. How can these things be? How? Can an old man enter his mother's womb again? And you know what Jesus answered him? He said, are you a master, a rabbi in Israel, and yet you don't understand this? You are a teacher in the synagogue, and you don't understand how to be born again? And when I read that, it was like for the first time it hit me. Jesus was not mocking Nicodemus. He loved Nicodemus. He wanted to see his salvation. So if he asked Nicodemus, do you not understand this? That means the born again experience had to be in the Old Testament or Nicodemus would have never known it. And I began crying out to the Lord, Lord, show me where this is. Jesus answered, that which is born, say this with me, of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. 
The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Human nature could not keep the law even if it would. And she's talking about internally. You may force the external to comply, but you can't change the inside. Apart from Christ, without union with Him, we can do nothing. Not until the life of Christ becomes a vitalizing power in our lives can we resist the temptations that assail us from within and from without. Unless we accept the atonement provided for us in the remedial sacrifice of Christ, who is our atonement, our at one with God, no genuine reform can be effected. Human barriers against natural and cultivated tendencies are but as the sandbank against the flood. But by becoming one with Christ, man is made free. I want to show you this. This right here changes everything. Listen to this. Sometimes Ellen White, um, she'll tell a story from the Bible. She'll explain it in a book. And then later on, you'll find that she explained that same story in another book, and you'll find that she added some pieces that she didn't include in this part. Have you ever seen that before? Listen to this. Do you know how the Bible says there's one faith, one Lord, and one, one baptism? It doesn't mean there's one way to get baptized alone. Guys, there's only one way to get baptized, but that's not what that verse is talking about. Listen to this. After Jesus had been baptized by John in the Jordan, he went straightway up out of the water to the bank of the river, and he bowed in the attitude of prayer. He just got out of the water. Here he identifies himself with sinners as our representative in taking upon him our sins and numbering himself with transgressors. In his prayer, Christ with his human arm, his human nature, encircles fallen humanity, while with his divine arm, he is reaching for the throne of the infinite. His hands were raised upward. His eyes were fixed as if penetrating heaven. He poured out his soul in supplication to his Father for strength to meet our unbelief and the sinfulness of men. To break the power of Satan over man. To be able to overcome Satan in behalf of man. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. He presents humanity, that's all of us, before his Father asking that he would grant to fallen man the light and strength and power from his own throne to successfully overcome the prince of the power of darkness. Never had angels listened to such a prayer. They were solicitous, ready and willing and eager to bear to the praying Redeemer messages of assurance and love. But no, the Father himself will minister to his Son. Direct from the throne proceeded the light of the glory of God. The heavens were opened and beams of light and glory proceeded therefrom. The people stood spellbound with fear and amazement. Their eyes were fastened upon Christ whose bowed form was bathed in the beautiful light and glory that ever surround the throne of God. His upturned face was glorified as they had never before seen the face of man. The thunders rolled and the lightnings flashed from the opening heavens, and a voice came therefrom in terrible majesty, saying, What's that say? In whom I am well pleased. Now look at the next statement. And the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan... This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, embraces all humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative. With all our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless, for he hath made us accepted in the beloved. 
The glory that rested upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. The light which fell from the open portals of heaven upon the head of our Savior will fall upon us as we pray for help to resist temptation. The voice which spoke to Jesus says to every believing soul, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. There was one faith, the faith of Jesus. There's one Lord, the Lord Jesus. There's one baptism, the baptism of Jesus. And if you were in Christ when he died, you were in him when he was being baptized. And when he received the gift of the Holy Spirit, you were in him. You were given the gift of the Holy Spirit if you will take hold of it by faith. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he was talking in Acts, he met those believers and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit yet? And they said, we hadn't even heard if there is such a thing. He said, under what then were you baptized? Under John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized under repentance, but he testified the one that comes after me will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. Do we believe this word that has been spoken to us from heaven? This is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. The Bible says, always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Romans 6.10 says, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. In that he died, he died unto sin. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. So that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. The Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and he lived a sinless life so that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature they could not overcome. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. He and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. 1 John 3, 9 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. For whosoever is begotten of God does not continue in sin. For God's seed, his word, Luke 8, 11 says, remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Amen. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified for you. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? For as many as received him, Jesus gave them power to become the sons and daughters of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, of God's will. And then James tells us, for of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, so that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, what's that say? Hath. It's done. He hath begotten us again unto a living hope. And people go, well, you can't say that if you're still in sin. How can you continue to sin if you believe that? Instead of looking at the glass as being half empty, realize that it's already been filled full. Lay hold on eternal life. This is how Nicodemus should have known how to be born again. Galatians chapter 4 says, Now we, brethren, just as Isaac was, are children by promise. 
Ishmael was born by the works of the flesh, Galatians says. But Isaac was born by promise. That's how we are born again. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is proclaimed unto you. The just shall live by faith. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we have got to lift one another in prayer, and we've got to lay hold on those promises. If you see somebody in your church that's stumbling and falling, instead of criticizing and condemning them, go to them alone and say, I want to pray with you. I've been there, or I know somebody that's been there. Lift up our brothers and sisters. Lift up our leaders. Lift our church up. God wants Jerusalem to shine so that the whole earth will be filled with his glory. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, Father, we're so weak without you. We struggle sometimes to believe the most simple truths that you have given us. Father, you are not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should change your mind. Your word has gone forth and cannot return unto you void. Father, you have promised each of us that you have chosen us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world so that we should be holy and without blame before you in love. Father, every moment in every life that is represented here. Until that day that Jesus comes and throughout all eternity, cause us to hear your voice in our heart, our minds, and our ears. Father, cause us to know the power of your word and cause us to know that you have promised us that you will keep us from falling. And you will present us faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy. Give us your voice, Lord Jesus Christ, of praise and thanksgiving. Father, I pray a special prayer for every young person that is here today. Father, the children have been such a blessing to all of us this week. We each lay hands on these children and we pray and claim your blessing upon them in the name of Jesus Christ. Raise these children up, Father, as an army. Proclaim the glad tidings of Jesus, of salvation and freedom, and of your son's soon return. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.